Welcome to What is Ness? What is Ness is a very educative program on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. What is Ness? It's a program that is asking questions about contemporary challenges confronting us as a nation. But in the process, we look for people with accumulated wisdom. And I'm in conversation with uh, Dr. Mrs. Josephine Labi Apple, who is a consultant uh, when it comes to e learning management system. And also, there's an association called Association of Educational and Instructional Technologies Ghana. And just by grace, uh, she at the moment is the national president. And we are discussing e learning as a new normal in education management. Last week, we, we talked about the need for a national conversation. And I think those who are into publication and the libraries uh, are also a key component yes. in, in, in this uh, year learning, uh, uh, this new normal, mm -hmm. you know, uh, education management. Because if, if I don't get my money and, and you talk about soft copies, you know, in fact, at the moment, even some students are smart. When you, you, you give your book, they manage to make photocopies, and they don't buy the book. You know, and so we must protect copyright and all that. But what I'm hearing from you is that it's possible to protect copyright of authors. Yes. You know, but they must be part of the national conversation. Yes. They have to be, because, again... Um, like I said, when you publish books, you are giving copies. You are not the owner of the book anymore because you sign contracts. So you cannot distribute the books without the knowledge of the publishers. So the publishers will have to come in. The what, has, what is happening is that the librarians do have, um, I wouldn't say um, connections, but they have to contact the publishers if it is a book that has been recommended and see how best they can deal with the publishers instead of dealing directly with the author of the book mm -hmm. because when you finish writing it is no more your copy unless maybe you publish it yourself somebody else published it so it is up to the institution and then the librarians to make sure they have those copies available for for the students mm -hmm. you know and um, again you are not going to put the whole book there mm -hmm. for for the students to assess mm -hmm. all right uh, if it is on amazon and somebody has purchased it online a 500 or 450 uh, page book. I don't think the person will want to uh, uh, just provide the link mm. to a student who didn't purchase the book to use it for free. Mm. Maybe if it's just uh, about two or three pages, he or she may but want to share. Siblings can do that. If if I'm in level 300, I finish, and next year my brother, sister is also level 300, it's the same computer. I just pass it on to him or her. So that was, yeah, it's possible. They, you know, well, these well, students well. are smart. They do all manner of things. Yeah, it is. But you, you can have hundred okay. percent. You know, um, perfect of everything okay. that you do. So Definitely, right. you will get um, infractions here and there. A, a sibling can pass it on to another sibling, but maybe friends, unless you are too close. Oh. <laughs> Actually, they, they do that. <laughs> they won't pass it to the enemies. But students <laughs> do all kinds of things. But can we talk about ye assessment? Yes. You see. We are talking about this new normal in education management. Now, now, when it's doing examination, you come to say KNUS have quality assurance. They want to make sure that even the printing of examination questions are properly done, protected, and invigilation and everything. And we are lecturers uh, in the room, invigilators, the same thing, WASI everywhere. And you are counting, you know, minutes, 10 minutes, more, 5 minutes, stop work. And stop work means stop work. And you make sure that wrong people don't enter into the examination room. So examination more practices, you, you try your best. So the, the integrity the, of your, your certificate, credibility of... Now, how do you guarantee integrity and, and credibility? Uh, uh, how can the quality assurance department make sure that if we say this is a first-class student, uh, that student did not stay at home somewhere and his or her brother uh, did some cut and paste 
and and we are awarding that student first class or second class APA or AAA. How do you guarantee <laughs> credibility in examination results? Thank you. I would want to say that if there is more credibility to examinations that we take online than even in the physical classroom mm. because there are a whole lot of checks and balances to prevent students from cheating. You know, one being that um, if you are a student, you have to log in using your credentials, you know, your username and password. But again, you can go beyond that by using um, uh, imaging, you know, as you sit behind a computer, the examination questions have been set, set in such a way that have been set in such a way that you have camera built into the examination question. It's a software that will capture the image of the student on the question paper. So as the student is writing, his picture is on the on the question paper or the answer the script that he is using. So it's captured. When the student decides to leave and comes back, it will capture it again. So assuming that you have a different person who is coming in because this first student, student A, who want to go out for a student B to to come and write the exams for the person, he will be captured in the system, and the system will trigger an alarm for a remote. Um, invigilator. I mean, as they are writing, there could be somebody, you know, or even on the paper, you have two images. So as soon as you pick the paper, you know that, you know, there is something wrong with the paper. Besides that, we have a way of setting up the questions. Let's assume that you have um, multiple choice questions. The multiple choice questions are organized in such a way that, I mean, they are organized randomly in such a way that if we have 100 questions, your question one will be my question 10. Your question five will be my question eight. So even if I talk to you in the examination room by asking you what is the answer for question one, and you say D, that answer could be for question 10. Mm. So we randomize the questions and randomize the answers too. The same question, question one, assuming you have question one, I have question one. My answer will be a D, which is Ghana. Your answer will be A, which is Ghana. So we have randomized the answers and randomized the questions. So there is no way the students can cheat. Besides that, it is time-based or time-bound. When you start the answering the questions, there is the clock. You set the clock. So if it is one hour, it starts ticking as soon as you hit start. So the clock, uh, the clock starts, you know, moving, going on. And so the time that you'll be wasting in talking, it's not going to waste, uh, wait for you. It is still going on. So there is no way you can do that. I remember one time I had a faculty training for, for faculty members, and I wanted them to experience that. There were, there, we, uh, we had t uh, 10 questions for 15 minutes. And so I asked them, I said I wasn't going to be in their room. Just do the questions. Do whatever you like. You can talk. You can, I don't, I don't mind even if you cheat. So I walked out of the class and then was standing outside and watching them then some of them wanted to talk to others they were like stop stop you know they were so busy everybody was conscious of the time they were looking on the computers and the time was running and they were conscious and i saw that there was tension in the room so i went back and told them that you are not students just relax <laughs> but they said the time was running so the time alone you know will prevent students from cheating besides that we can have remote uh, kind of prompted system where you, if you want students to be in an examination room, you set up cameras and the cameras will capture the image of the student every 30 minutes, depending on how you set it. Every 30 minutes it will capture the image and this will be trans transferred to a point that the one that is controlling it can be view review all that is happening there. There is audio capturing too. If you talk to somebody, it is captured. So when they play back, they will realize that, you know, there is some cheating going on. Even they can lock down the window and have only the examination, the scripts, such that you cannot move in between two windows. Say you are using your, uh, the computer and you have answers somewhere because you expect certain answers. The computers can be locked down such that you cannot move in between two windows or go on the internet. 
and if you make the attempt one it will give you warning two another warning third one you are locked out mm. you cannot continue with the examination mm. so the checks and balances in the system are more than you know expected and so when students go online to write or do examinations it is it is it is more you know reliable trustworthy than even in the physical classroom where you have people writing on their bodies and all that interesting viewers this is what is next and i'm in conversation with uh, dr mrs josephine labi apple who is a consultant uh, when it comes to ye learning management system and also there's association called association of educational and instructional technologies ghana just by grace uh, she at the moment is the national president and we are discussing ye learning as a new normal in education management now auntie josephine last week i asked you this question i'm going to ask the same question again because it will lead to uh the the the, the issue that we want the fact that now social distancing has become the response to coronavirus or of other one but it's like we did not have the opportunity to study the unintended effects and i just want to find your impression about this issue when it comes to especially private institutions in fact the same with public institutions but are you sure that the private institutions for all of them have studied have in depth study about the impact of uh, 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 this social distancing e learning uh, uh, in the educational management especially of private institutions hmm. well, I have had some interactions with the private universities and have worked with them before I would say that the um, innovative ones have thought about it but as to whether they have invested the resources to move forward with that, that is a different matter. But uh, under the present circumstance, they are the ones that will be challenged or that will um, experience the effect of the pandemic more. The reason being that uh, most of them rely solely on the revenue from the students. You know, when the students pay fees, or they live in the hostels or the halls. Uh, that is when they get some revenue to be able to meet their financial obligations. But as it is now, I'm sure most of them are struggling uh, without knowing you know, where to begin because maybe they didn't think about this earlier on. Always looking at physical infrastructure. Where can we cite this? Where can we have that? Uh, to the point that most of the private institutions do have about three or four scattered campuses, you know, physical campuses. I do believe that if they have invested, they had invested in, you know, technology instead of having the physical infrastructures, it would have helped them in the present state. But um, looking at the effects, the uh, COVID-19, you know, pandemic is going to have on the private institutions, uh, unlike the public institutions where maybe the government will continue to uh, provide some uh, subventions or some financial, make some financial commitment here and there, the private businessman will suffer, you know, in terms of where it is getting its revenue from. So uh, I'm sure the effect will be greater there. Now, you realize that the, the non-tuition fees uh, the use of facilities for conferences, hostels, dormitories, uh, sporting activities. Now, in fact, both public and private. But the private universities, this is where they get money from. Mm -hmm. Now, not only the universities, but even the secondary school level. Government through Ministry of Education came out as a result of uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, no gathering, stay home. Now there are schools 
how do you pay staff March ending? How do you pay staff uh, uh, April ending? And if you continue like this, May ending. You know, so if you don't get the non tuition fee, moving into the future, if you continue with e learning, if we get there, how do the private institution, public, you said government subvention, but how will the private institution, secondary and mm -hmm. tertiary, how will they raise funds if you are, they are not going to get the non tuition fees? That is a big challenge to them, and um, I'm, I'm not going to think for the board. I'm but I'm asking you can... because of the exposure you have. You've yes. had the opportunity to teach <laughs> every girl's uh, at Chemota, so that is secondary school. You've <laughs> been uh, at Presby University, Montcrest, and others, and then you have had the opportunity also to teach some institution outside Ghana. So you are the right person to answer this question because you belong there. Yes. Um. I'm not too sure whether the private institutions are doing other businesses apart from education, but I'm assuming that their main focus is education and that some of them are renting their premises mm -hmm. for the purposes of uh, making or getting some revenue to support some of the administrative functions of the investors. Now that the sc uh, schools are not in section, uh, definitely they are going to lose for the fact that they cannot get those um, revenues anymore. But I do remember, um, if I'm right, the government was looking at how to cushion uh, private businesses. I don't know, I, I think they talked about small and medium mm -hmm. scale you know, businesses. I don't know if the private universities can be categorized as small mm -hmm. or medium, but Looking at the trend and for the fact that they are going to suffer as a result of, you know, inability to mop up this revenue from the sources you mentioned, uh, I would suggest that maybe they come together and then have uh, a consultation with the government and see how best the government can cushion them, you know, because like you are saying, they, they will still have to maintain their staff. They cannot lay them off. If they have to lay them off, when, when, when the uh, COVID pandemic is over, what happens? Are they going to recruit them as new recruiters or um, what happens to these people? And again, they have individuals that are working there. That can be put under the bracket of maybe the underprivileged, you know, those working, the janitors and all that. And they need to survive and they need to pay them. So I think um, they'll have to have a serious conversation with the government and see how best the government can support them as small scale or medium scale businesses mm -hmm. that are losing out because of the closure of the but there's a challenge uh, there are workers who are having the, this fear at the moment that if we sustain the new normal the year learning mm -hmm. And we are not getting huge numbers going to the dining hall it means dining hall or cafeteria staff may be reduced if we are not keeping huge numbers in dining hall uh certain workers cleaners and others may be reduced so there's this fear that if you sustain year learning uh, the new normal approach to education management some staff they may be laid off some staff may lose their jobs or they may be salary uh, you know cut because now the monies you get from say your halls uh hostels you are not getting and so either you lay off or you cut you know that fear do you consider that to be a genuine fear <laughs> especially from the private in, from secondary school uh, uh to university the private side if a worker is having this fear knowing what you know is it a genuine a genuine fear or they are exaggerating something it is genuine. Uh, the, the, the fear is genuine. But the fortunate thing about what is going on in Ghana is that we haven't gotten to the stage where we can go fully online. Because mm -hmm. looking at our ICT infrastructure, looking at our internet, and even at times we have this um, uh, doom so doom so <laughs> <laughs> kind of stuff, you know, we haven't gotten to a stage where we can deploy fully online so 
in as much as some of the workers will be affected depending on the period of the pandemic. Because, of course, the universities cannot continue to pay staff that are doing nothing, you know, on their campuses. If, say, it continues for one year, you cannot be paying f workers for one year without maybe the, the um, best scenario will be to compensate them for them to be looking for jobs elsewhere. But online in itself will not lay people off because we need people to design courses. We need people to facilitate the learning process. And this will be the faculty members and the teachers. You know, maybe there will be no need for a, a cafeteria, you know, if we go fully online. But we are not going fully online because we are not there yet as the Ghanaian, you know, system. We are not there yet. And so it has to be gradual. Even to the point that, say, for the next 10, assuming that, you know, because of the COVID, we are going to go online. The best practice we can adopt will be in a blended mode where we have face-to-face, -face, part face-to-face, -face, and then part online. So most of the workers will be retained. If I want to give a typical example, when computers were introduced, the accountants, it was introduced around the early 90s, 1924 days. Accountants thought their jobs are going to be taken over by calculators. Mm. But they are still there, and now they are even using the calculators to make their work easier. So there is no way people will be laid off because they are going online. We need people to facilitate. And as we go online and we expand the intake, if we increase the admission, it means we will need more people. Say if you have, there is one course that almost about 160 students took in an artificial intelligence course, 160,000. It means you need more teachers to facilitate the program. So they will not be laid off. But again, when it comes to maybe the cafeteria system, by janitors, we do have offices. So some of them can be still employed to do those work. But let me assure people that going online does not necessarily mean that you are going to be laid off. We haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. We will still maintain, assuming that we go online, it will be in a blended mode where the physical infrastructures that we have will still be relevant as much as the technology, you know, bit will also be relevant in a blended mode. Yes. Now, I just want you to look straight to this <laughs> camera. You said two important things. Earlier on, you said that government must consider the private institutions among those that they are giving support because they are providing a service. Yes. Some cannot pay their staff. And just whoever is watching, we may not know that the private institutions, secondary and universities must be concerned. Then you have also laid a solid emphasis that if somebody is afraid that in the name of e-learning, they are going to lose their job, uh, they must keep hope alive. Just look <laughs> through to this camera and talk to my viewers <laughs> the, on these two subjects. Yes. Hello, viewers. Uh, let me begin with saying that going online to teach will not translate into losing your jobs. The worst case scenario for faculty and teachers will be to appoint them as agents or part-timers because most of the things you'll be doing will be done by somebody else. Let's assume that uh, you are teaching a course and a lot of people are going to teach the course. You will need somebody to design the course so that it will be like a massification production of the course. But you still be needed to facilitate the program. And with the numbers that we have in Ghana, you know, going to school, there is no way that you are going to lose your job as a teacher. For the janitors, let me just say that um, you still, there are physical infrastructures out there and we still have to maintain them. So be assured that uh, no matter how long it takes, there will still be people to be doing those jobs. So you are not going to lose your job. Again, with the private institutions, I know it is very difficult because I have been in the system before. I know how it feels. At times it's difficult for even some of the uh, university management and administrators to meet their financial commitments. 
please come together, talk to the government. I know I'm not the one to suggest what you have to do, but being a uh, part of the system and providing services to the people, the good people of Ghana, I think when you come together and discuss your issues with the government, there could be a way out. So we are all going through this together and we have to survive, you know, as we go through this. That's why you want the government to extend support to the private institution. Yes, because under the circumstances... You've been a former register of a private university <laughs> before, so you know what they are going through. <laughs> yes, Please I know. Please extend the appeal. Again, I'm extending <laughs> this to the good people of um, Ghana and to the private institutions. One, having been in the system before, I think you have to re-engineer your whole program anyway because most of you are doing the same thing and you are distributing the students amongst yourselves. So you should come together. Come together and look at how you can survive a system full of challenges. You know, one being that now the schools have been closed down. What do you do? Some of you cannot meet your financial obligations because of the number of students you are uh, admitting. It's too small for you to meet. You don't have to rely on that. But in the midst of the COVID-19, think about it. The government is giving out some help. I will want to use help to some small scale and medium scale businesses. You are running your institutions as a business. So please talk to the government and see how best they can give you the help they can give to you to go through these challenges. Viewers, this is what is next. And my guest is Dr. Mrs. Josephine uh, Labia Paul. Nicely, the lady as she is, she is saying that private institutions should come together and make appeal to government and call for help, call for support. In a way, what I'm hearing her saying is that government please consider the private institution. Even though they are running their own private institutions like businesses, but at the moment we are aware that small scale, medium scale uh, businesses are being uh, <laughs> given support. Let somebody think about private institutions. Their collapse may not be of any help to us and our children. This is what is next. And uh, Auntie Josephine, you know, we have children and students who have different learning abilities. We have some who have sight challenges. We have some who have hearing uh, challenges. And the e learning. And how do you meet students with different learning uh, abilities and challenge. Some students are fast learners, some students are uh, uh, slow learners, but especially those with sight and hearing. How uh, uh, do we plan for such in the new normal education management? Thank you. Let me uh, pick the slow learners and uh, the others first, and then I'll come to those that are physically challenged. Uh, with the slow learners, one one beautiful thing about online learning is the flexibility. So students are not forced to do things as in the physical classroom. Say you go to a lecture, three hours, and then you give assignments to the students. You expect the students to maybe do the assignment in class and submit maybe the next day or something like that. In the online system, you have maybe a whole week for the students to uh, submit the assignment. They will do and submit it at their, um, at, at a, as and when they have completed the assignment. So the slow learners can catch up, you know. There's flexibility in online learning. Besides that, if we come to the learners with disability or physically challenged, we have what is called adaptive and assistive technologies mm. that can help them. Uh, the, the, the physically impaired hearing aids are there to help them assuming that there's an audio you know online audio that the lecturer will want students to listen to if the student is uh, physically challenged as a result of your hearing impairment you know he should be able to be supported with hearing aid for him or her to 
hear what the lecturer is saying. When it comes to the, the, um, those who are visually challenged, it's the same thing. They have adaptive technologies that can assist them to learn, to type, you know, and submit the assignments online instead of doing it and printing it out. Um, when it comes to maybe those with uh, working, you know, disabilities, that one, they are free now. They are able to sit behind the computers and do it without having the stress of going through the staircase to the physical classroom. So they can also have the opportunity to learn. So all these things are there for us to explore and see how best we can support, you know, students with this adaptive technology when they are physically challenged or impaired. Now let's talk about mentoring. You know, the face-to-face -face kind of education or the physical uh, interaction, it is not only teaching students mathematics, science, engineering, but directly and indirectly, teachers, lecturers are able to influence uh, their students, some through church services, through dormitories, some students are even able to bring students closer to them and, and help them, the difficult ones, you know. How do we factor mentoring, uh, uh, you know, that part of formation, especially in a e-learning environment? Mm -hmm. um, whatever we are doing physically can be transferred, you know, in the virtual environment. So we can have counseling using virtual platforms mm -hmm. where mentors can still interact with their students. Students can interact with themselves, you know, learn from each other. Faculty members can interact with their students. In fact, when you, you take a learning management system, which is a software that has been designed for online learning, you have the features to support all these interactions. Besides that, as I discussed last week, we have what is called virtual office. So a virtual office can be set up for students to come and talk to their mentors or supervisors or chair through the virtual platform, chats. And even there, they have access on one-on-one, -on -one, more than even the physical, because at times you realize that when people are shy, they find it difficult to even approach, you know, their supervisors. Mm -hmm. They go to discuss issues with their friends or peers more than going to their supervisors. But here it is like you have the security and the privacy of discussing your issues with only your mentor or mentee. So that opportunity is there. The only thing you'll be missing is the physical, mm -hmm. you know, the physical human interaction that will not be there. But still, you can interact with your students. <laughs> In fact, with the students' research has shown that they, when they go online, they go through a whole lot of processes. And as they go through the processes from being frustrated to socialization, to knowledge, you know, development, to constructing of their own understanding, and to development and understanding of the general, you know, course that you have given to them. I mean, it's a process. And as they do that, they meet a lot of, you know, people that have similar uh, kind of interests and ideas and from there they can even continue you the faculty member having interacted with your student or the counselor or the mentor having interacted with your student through online you get to know them better and know the challenges of each of them and so you can do counseling you know more even when you are online the only thing is that the that physical uh, interaction will not be there but you still have the option to interact with them virtually. But again, Ghana is not ready to go purely mm -hmm. virtual. Mm -hmm. So you still have the opportunity to interact with your students, mm -hmm. you know, physically. Yeah, but but y you know that in some of our schools, in fact, everywhere, there are students who are able to come together and build relationship, relationships on campuses, dormitory, halls, mm -hmm. you know, and after school, some of such relationships 
uh, lead to business connections. Some become business partners. Some political affiliations. We were together on campus. He was the SRC president. I was this. And they find themselves in political parties and on and on. In fact, some have been able to build healthy relationships. Some have become, you know, marriages. Some have become good spouses. Now, if you reduce this physical contact, how do we also replace this aspect, this dimension of schooling, which is very good? <laughs> you know, how do we integrate such strengths of the face-to-face, -face, the physical interaction kind of education system that we have now into this uh, learning uh, that now gradually we are getting there if we are not there already. How do I guarantee that some students can still relate and end up either in business, politics, or even mud bridges? Say after class, with the physical class, af after classes, you get students working together and then just like you are saying, sharing ideas. Uh, when they go home, they can come together, go and sit somewhere. The same thing can be done online. And again, I want to insist that it is the physical, you know, being present physically that they will miss. But still chatting, having to have that personal, you know, interaction will still be there. Because people are um, even getting their partners online these days. You know, but that so when they don't get, some don't get good spouses. You see, now you, 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 you can you can <laughs> manipulate somebody is not nice, but they can do something. You look online, they are, you know, very beautiful. But when you see the real person, they look something else. Right. But if you're in the same class, dormitory, going to church, you watch the person. <laughs> and if that friendship is becoming marriage, you know him or her. <laughs> but this online thing, people can deceive you. Oh, what do you think? Yes, from experience. Yes. You get to know people better even when you are online because oh. of the way they interact. Okay. You see, with the online system, we have forum, we have discussions. Uh, you set assignment and people come in to respond to that. So as they respond, you can even identify the individual characteristics of each of them based on how they respond to issues online. Now, as I talked about earlier, when they come online, they socialize. They begin with their frustrations because they want to find their way. But then they socialize. So they are able to identify. And through the discussion to know that it looks like, you know, we have a common interest. It looks like I have a common interest with this one. So they try to click to each other. And even when you set assignment, like a group assignment, you see them coming together. And they don't do that only online in your online classroom. After that, they continue with the conversation, you know, virtually. Mm. Well, we are in a Ghanaian system. They can still have the virtual, you know, interactions. But when they go out of the classroom, they are still living in the same community. Except for the fact that we are now under the social distances. They cannot maybe come together physically. But besides being online, it doesn't prevent them from meeting physically outside of the classroom. So they can continue with the relationship after class. But they can begin from the class, from the virtual class, mm -hmm. knowing how to respond to questions, knowing how intelligent somebody is. Because when you are, when students are posting, you know, responses to assignments, you can, you can know from their responses who is, you know, giving you the right. And the student can detect. And at times you see them moving or towards the one that is intelligent or the one that is giving the right responses. So they will even use names. You know, they will call your name and direct questions or direct something to the individual. So that is where the relationships will start. And then they continue uh, virtually or physically. But the morale that we have on university campuses, we are not going to get. If you are Katanga University or Commonwealth, you know, and you come and you know those who have zeal, who are bold, and then you connect with them. And after school, you know, I'm going to have this guy as my business partner. You can't do morale online. You can, you, you can. You know what I'm talking about. I know what yeah, you, you are talking about. Yeah, you've been at Coast University and, you know, you know, we have fun. Yeah. <laughs> this kind of thing, how do you, you do you it can, on online? 
Okay, for online is a classroom. Yes. Just like you can't have fun in your classroom, physical classroom. You can't have fun <laughs> <laughs> on online classroom. But after classes, you can have the fun. But they can identify. In fact, once when students come to your class, the very first thing for you to do is to get their pictures and profile. Mm. So every student, if you are even teaching for 500 students, you should have the profile. A little bit. Everybody will have to introduce. You will start it as the lecturer by introducing yourself to the class with your picture. And then you ask individual students to provide their pictures, you know, profile, and then about themselves. So students will get to know who they are, and then they'll pick. They'll start picking from the profiles of the students and start the connection from there. Mm. So they will move the connection from virtual to physical. Viewers, <laughs> <laughs> this is what is nice on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. Now, Auntie Josephine, those of us in the humanities, social sciences, if you ask me to do teaching, learning online, I can just prepare models, lecture notes sent to my student. But if somebody is into pharmacy, medicine, uh, engineering, they do a lot of lab work. Is there space for them also in e-learning, maybe within a second or two? Yes. You can use simulations and we have virtual labs. I mean, if it becomes necessary that you don't have to go to the physical lab, mm -hmm. you have virtual labs, you have virtual, you have simulations that you can use to teach such courses. Okay. Now, the pandemic will definitely end. But our future depends on learning its lessons for our educational management system. Are you optimistic about the future? I am very, very optimistic. Uh, your last word to my viewers. <laughs> <laughs> your last word to my viewers. Very, very optimistic about it, but it depends on how we reorient yeah. ourselves to, you know, accept the new normal. Okay. So if we are able to accept it and do the right thing, I think uh, we have a brighter future. Viewers, I have been in conversation with Dr. Mrs. Josephine Labi Appel. She is the president of the Association of Educational and Instructional Technologists Ghana at the moment. And she is also a consultant when it comes to e-learning management system. She has had opportunity to teach from the secondary school level, schools like Brie Girls, Achimota, and Fancy Man Girls, and she's close to University of Cape Coast, uh, Presby University, Moncrest, and the uh, uh, Ghana Telecommunication uh, yeah, uh, University. university. And she has uh, also had teaching experience in some universities and other institutions in the U.S. And she is telling us on what is next that we've reached a point where utilities in our homes should not only be water and electricity but internet facility must be considered considered as utilities because we've reached a point where ye learning has become the new normal every Ghanaian child she is saying even from basic to university must have access to internet and she is saying that the telecommunication must consider high speed facilities because now children need that to learn and she has called for a national conversation on this e-learning which has become the new normal please stay safe with we are not in normal times take good care of yourself let's listen to uh, the professionals the instructions they are giving to us but let us love god let us love ghana may god bless our homeland ghana and make this country great and strong my name is kwabino puni from paul I'll come your way same time next week. Till then, God richly bless us all. Amen. <laughs>